Hello, Vanessa. I am Hi, so excited to speak to you today. I'm excited to speak to you as well. You're, you're a real hero of mine and everything that you've been doing. I follow you. I, I read your words. I tell my children about you and I educate them on the messages you're sending. And I have, uh, I've learned so much already and I'm excited to have a chance to help expand your voice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Angelina. That's really beautiful of you to know that someone like you is sharing my story with your kids. It's really amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, the work you're doing is really, it's, it's teaching, teaching all of us because, you know, as you, as you know more than anyone, the conversation about the climate crisis has been very limited to to what is happening, most often they focus on the, the Western world or, or they focus on a few voices or, um, but, but not as much the impact where it is happening most and to whom it is happening most. And, and, uh, and I thought maybe you could teach me during this call about different things, um, you know, I know you, you got involved when you're in your early 20s. I started to work with you in, when, in my early 20s. Um, wow. I think for similar reasons, because I, I realized there was a lot that I was not educated on, and I started to ask a lot of questions. So how did you, how did you get involved? Well, I remember in the year 2018, I wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my community. That was a period before my graduation. Therefore, I started carrying out research to understand the challenges that the people were facing. And I was really surprised to find that climate change was one of those problems, actually the biggest threat facing humanity right now. So I decided to read more about it, to understand its causes, to understand its impacts. And when I realized that literally every part of my country, Uganda, is affected by the climate crisis, when you go to the north, the people are suffering with long dry spells. When you go to the eastern part of the country, they are suffering with landslides and floods. In the western part of the country, they are suffering with floods. So realizing that this was an urgent matter, that was threatening the availability of food for the people in my country and the access to clean water, I decided that I had to become a voice in the climate movement and try to, you know, get justice for all the challenges that they're facing. And honestly, I was really planning to do this for like a period of seven months. And after my graduation, I had no plans of continuing with activism. But then um, it really became personal in a way because I felt like if I was to stop, I would be letting down millions of people who are being affected by the climate crisis. And we need your voice out there because there aren't enough people aware of what's happening. So there's not enough being done to stop it from growing worse. So when you hear this, when you hear, uh, for example, now the amount of people around the world who are suffering hunger or in need of food, that must be very frustrating when you know that it's, it's it really breaks my heart to think about that because I've seen many of them and some of them must treat children in Kampala. So it is very frustrating to think that a child has to uh, go hungry for an entire day without having access to food. And knowing that that will most likely, that the, that why people are saying that is, is maybe not very honest, right? Because often you hear, people are going hungry because of conflict or people are going hungry because of bad governance or people are going hungry because, uh, you know, for many reasons, but it's not always linked as you point out, as it should be to climate and, and what is happening and the floods and the, the deserts expanding the dryness. Um, so I, I think it's really, really, you've, you really taught me something. It was something I learned from you in your work to really think about that and the effects of that. 
You know, I think it's also really important to think that, you know, some of the conflicts arise from the shortages in resources. For example, I'll speak about Lake Chad in Africa. It has shrunk to 10th its size in just 50 years. And you understand that the population keeps on growing. So there is definitely going to be a struggle for resources, a struggle for the waters of that lake. And uh, this will, of course, disrupt the peace in the area. So I think that the issue of climate change actually relates with uh, peace building in communities. So, yes, people may not have access to food, but then when you look at the roots of all this, sometimes it starts from the disasters of climate change and then to the food insecurity or to the water insecurity. And then the next thing is that people are struggling and fighting for resources. You choosing to do what you do and go out into your country, I know, I know there's a difference if I go on the street right now um, or if you go on the street because climate activism is, is not easy in many places. In my country, of course, uh, there is an issue of strikes and usually strikes in very large numbers could lead to arrest. This is uh, definitely a challenge for me as an activist and the rest of the activists. It is not easy to go out there, especially in the beginning when I was doing the strikes uh, by myself. Uh, my family really didn't understand what I was doing. Uh, my parents never really knew what I was doing, but they had a clue that um, I was uh, advocating for protection of the planet, but they really didn't understand the whole thing with the climate strikes. And then most of my friends found it very, very weird because uh, in high school, I was in a in a single in a single school and it was only girls and um, in that school uh, they always taught us issues of respect dignity so literally what i was doing was contradicting myself to the values that were taught so many of my friends found it really weird and they found it a waste of time that's why uh, many of them took long to actually get involved and ask questions about the climate activism and why I was doing that. So it was quite a complicated beginning for me. But later on, uh, many of them started understanding why I was doing this. And some of them decided to get involved. But I must add that it is really complicated to do activism in my country. So you're, you're not only out speaking and raising awareness, but you're also which I, I think is so important. You're, you're looking for practical solutions with young people, with schools, and, and um, I've heard with solar, solar panels, is it? Or what, what, tell me what you're doing with the schools and, and what you're encouraging. Well, um, along the way during my activism, I decided to start providing solutions and not to just uh, request for justice because I believe that some of these communities are not capable of getting these solutions in their families or in the schools. So I decided to start a project that involves the installation of solar panels that is solar energy and institutional stoves in schools. And um, I chose that project simply because we need a, re uh, a transition to renewable energy. And many of these schools uh, in the rural communities, they cannot afford uh, the, the solar panels and all the costs that are involved in the installation and also the stoves as well. Um, they help to reduce on the amount of firewood that these schools use in a town. For example, if a school is to use five trucks of firewood, they use two trucks of firewood with this stove, hence reducing on the, the trees that they are cutting down. And it's also um, a learning experience for the students for the teachers and for the parents, because at the end of the day, they ask questions like, why are you doing this? Why are you giving us the solar? And I have to come in and explain. So it's a form of climate education to them. And um, this project has been possible for the first two schools that I've worked on because it's uh, fully monitored and financed by the internet. And we hope that we can cover as many schools as possible because I believe that 
if we bring this transition in schools and hopefully in households, people will start getting the education about uh, climate change and they'll start understanding the solutions that they need to take in order to ensure the protection of our planet and also the protection of their lives. With so many people out of school and, and many girls out of school, I know that that is also something you're passionate about, the effects of all of this. Well, um, I have seen it, especially in this period of time, that um, more girls uh, got pregnant during this lockdown uh, from their areas. And most of these girls are teenagers. And it is really heartbreaking to see how vulnerable the girl child is because we are in a time whereby many people are struggling to make ends meet. Some of them have lost their jobs and um, it's very, very, very disturbing. So many parents are pushed to give away girls for marriage because in my country with giving out a girl for marriage, you're going to receive bride price. So, and it's never really a lot that they receive, but most of them do it just to cover for the expenses of that period when they're in a crisis, like what we are facing right now. So it is something that I've been thinking about and it is really, really, really hard. I reached out to some people to get some advice from them. And some of them, of course, were telling me, um, your cause is mainly climate, um, Maybe you should find someone to help you do that. And I think that um, that is really, it's not necessary to, to focus on just one cause and yet people continue to suffer because even in climate change, the women are the most affected. These women are the ones who put food on the table. They put uh, water on the table. They provide all these things for their families. And yet in an occurrence of a disaster, they suffer the most. And that makes me realize that the women are really affected the most in the, in the climate crisis and any other sector. So we cannot get climate justice without addressing the challenges that women are facing in their daily lives, especially the issue of violence and marriage of teenage girls. Say it better. I hope everyone hears what you just said. You're, and you're right. People often these days focus. They say you, you need to focus on one thing or try. This is your area. And, and they don't see it. And I don't think there's enough in the media that helps people connect the dots to all of these issues. They are absolutely, of course, interconnected. And the exactly. vulnerability for women and and the inability for a woman to be able to escape a situation. There's often, and domestic violence is something that is across the world everywhere. It is something that is, um, you know, very, they, there's something that someone said once, uh, they say, why didn't she leave? And they say, why is the focus always, why didn't she leave? Why isn't the focus, why didn't he stop? And, exactly. and what, and, and often the woman is trapped because of the financial situation, because the community won't believe her or support her. So even yeah. if she was willing to go with very little money and live in the middle of nowhere, uh, with nothing, she would even be cut off further by by a community in a way where she's punished. Um, yeah. When I speak to women like you, and I think of the future, you know, even 20 years ago, maybe there wasn't, there weren't as many young girls in your country and around the world aware of these issues, speaking on these issues, fighting for these issues. So I imagine there will be a future where you're all fighting for each other, taking care of each other more, giving each other opportunities, yeah. uh, you know, asking for accountability when there is abuse. And so I, 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 believe, I believe you're part of what's going to make this change, which is very Thank necessary. Thank you so much. And I, I also wanted to ask you about, I'm, I'm living in, in the United States right now, and there's a lot happening with Black Lives Matter. And um, I wondered, this is another issue of how things are so connected. And I think um, I wanted to ask if you would speak about the inequality that you see um, when it comes to the, the, the way uh, these global issues are handled. Well, um, this inequality, of course, 
starts from the kind of system that we're in, that, you know, we just find ourselves in. It is a system that needs to be completely shattered, if I should say, because if we continue in this kind of system, we are continuously going to see inequalities and we are going to see the most um, the most affected people continuously being uh, traumatized continuously being destroyed and being left with nothing now with what is happening in the states in regards to the black lives matter when i found out about that it was very very heartbreaking of course and very disturbing to think that there are actually people out there who are suffering uh, terrible, terrible um, actions of racism. And it is something that I experienced to that to some extent, but it, it wasn't as, you know, as deep as what is happening in the States. I remember in January, as I happened to be cropped out of a photo with other climate activists and to me, that was a form of racism and it felt like I had been robbed of my space and I wasn't the first. And um, that what followed next in what is happening in the United States shows that this is continuously going to happen unless we put an end to a system that uh, promotes a white saviorism. You know, many times my siblings ask me, why is... Um, why is Jesus always white and why is the Saturn always black? And it's really hard to answer some of those questions because they have this picture that black is evil, that black is not good. Even in movies, that is how it is portrayed. So it's, a, it's generally a system that affects every sector of life. But then we need to understand that we will not be able to get the justice that we are looking for in whatever sector if we do not amplify uh, the communities that are the most affected, if we don't look out for those marginalized communities, people of color, and you know, raise their voices and give solutions to their problems. Because the black community has so much suffered with the climate crisis. It is the least it is the least responsible when it comes to emissions into the atmosphere, if I'm to speak for Africa. But what is happening in Africa, it, it's almost like it is the cause of the climate crisis. It has contributed the, the largest you know, to the climate crisis, but then it is suffering the most, and yet it is the least emitter. The people are suffering, people are dying, people have no food to eat, people have no water, people are suffering with conflicts as a result of climate change. And this goes back to the injustices in the system. We need to work on the system that ensures equality of all the people, because if we do not work towards equality, you know, at the end of the day, we are all the same. Um, I usually say this, it may sound really weird, but we all have skeletons within us if our bodies are like split. So I think we are all the same and there is really no difference regardless of where you come from, regardless of who you are, because we are all working towards, actually we should all work towards a better future that involves um, everyone, making sure that everyone's rights are protected, making sure that everyone can access the necessary basic needs. That is how we will be able to have a more peaceful world, a more beautiful world, a more healthier life, because we cannot achieve, um, let me say, climate justice without including social justice. We cannot achieve climate justice without Literally, everything is so interconnected. So the Black Lives Matter are protests. They are literally saying what has been happening for quite a long time. And it needs to come to an end. It needs to come to an end. We need to support the Black community because they have suffered for so long. They continue to suffer. And even those in the African continent, they continue to suffer as well. If we don't address the issue of... Uh, of racial justice, we won't be able to get climate justice. So every activist, actually, every climate activist should be uh, advocating for racial justice because if your climate justice does not involve um, the most affected communities, then it is not justice at all. One of the things that's also um, been interesting is education. I don't know about the schools in Uganda, um, but I know 
I know in the United States, there's a, a very big question, particularly about the history. My, my daughter is from Ethiopia, one of wow. my children. And I, I have learned so much from her. She is, she is my family, but she is an extraordinary African woman and her connection to her country, her continent her, is very, is her own. And it's, it's something I only stand back in awe of. But what I see in, for example, American history books and how limited they are about, um, they, they don't, they, they really start teaching um, people who are black about their lives through the civil rights movement, which is such a horrible place to begin. And I wonder if there's, if you think that there are ways to, uh, things we need to change about our education systems or ways we can further educate people about um, about Africa, about, about being a black woman, about all that you know and you feel in your roots of your country and uh, ways you, you know, because it's not just whether they crop a picture in Davos, it's what they missed, the, the, the extraordinary all that you are, uh, the loss of, of <laughs> them not seeing you. Uh, so... Well, um, I think what people really need to first understand is that Africa is not just a country. That is something that, um, you know, I've had so much and people referring to Africa as just a country. It's actually a continent with uh, 54 countries. So people need to know that and uh, they need to understand that uh, the history, you know, of course it needs to change from different schools, from different countries, because even in my country, I remember the history that, you know, that we learned about and it talked so much of, you know, slavery and all of that. I think that that is a narrative that needs to change. And uh, I mean, we don't need to learn about all that cruelty that our people went through, because to me, it completely lowers your value as a person. Because the more I, I read about the history of African people uh, being enslaved, it makes me think that, okay, this is a, um, a higher power, this is a higher race, and I'm down here. So it's, as a child, I grow up, you know, with that feeling that mm -hmm. this is our I would say a major race and I'm, I'm a race of uh, the minority and really my say isn't really, really strong. And uh, this, this is something that really needs to change. I think African children or any other children should be taught about the, the power that lies within Africa. You know, yes, you may talk about slaves, but then I'll say those weren't slaves. Those were doctors from Africa, nurses from Africa, actors from Africa, actresses from Africa, teachers from Africa. That, that's what people really need to know, that the African continent is not just about the history of slavery. It's about the young people who grew up and became doctors, who became professionals in their own careers. That's what people need to understand. And um, I think the other thing, they need to know that when an African voice speaks, then it's really an important matter because for a very long time, uh, we have few voices coming out of the African continent that are amplified because there are always those people who are working in the communities, but they never get a chance for their stories to be heard. And I personally believe that every person who comes out there and uh, maybe demands for justice or advocates for change in their community, I believe that they have a story to tell. And I believe that their story has a solution to give. And I believe that uh, their solution has a life to change. So people need to understand that the African people have solutions that will change the world. Absolutely. I think there's been, I, I think often of, because of, of, uh, of work in, in conflicts and, and uh, displacement, I notice often there's, there's very little focus on what, what are, the, not just a solution from outside, a solution from, as you say, from within. I think there's a real question of whether or not and this is, you know, from the Western world, whether there was real 
ever real interest in empowering others when we speak about any kind of foreign aid or work? Was it was it really to empower others or was it to be able to continue to control in some way? Um, and I think there's some good intentions, but I think there's been a lot that has intentionally not empowered countries and allowed them to do all that they can do and their own solutions, their own voices, their own resources, their own exactly. business models. Do you, uh, so what, I have so many questions. What, um, you're, you're 23? Yes. Is that right? So, so what do you, um, and you went, I read that you went to, did you focus on business for a period or is that, you did? Yeah, I studied business. You studied business. And why business? Yeah. Well, um, my, my parents are so much into business and I grew up seeing my mom and my dad um, being self-employed and being able to, to provide for, for the family. So I grew up with the mentality that I can be able to provide for my family better if I do business and I also start my business someday. So I just grew up with that mentality and I actually, I never really liked, um, employment, uh, maybe from a company or from uh, a workplace. I didn't really admire getting a job because I saw that uh, my parents through self-employment were able to take care of me and take care of my other siblings. So I really just grew up with the love for doing business. And when the time came for selection, I decided to do that. Activism, I thought I'd do it for just seven months, but later on, I just wanted to keep doing this and, you know, to keep striking and demanding for change. So I really hope that I can have a business uh, in future that will cater for the welfare of the people and ensure that uh, they are protected and that they are fairly treated. Because I believe that uh, businessmen, businesswomen, they actually have a role to play in ensuring that the planet is protected and that the people are also protected. Are there other activists or leaders or uh, voices, you know, that you also look to these days? Well, um, of course, in Africa, there are, there are quite a number of activists uh, that I've got to know, that I've got to meet, and I've got to learn from them and their, their amazing work that they're doing. And I really have no specific person that I, I look up to, but then um, there are the, the different activists in Kenya, in Uganda, and I've been able to learn from them because you know no one can be an island you may think that you know everything but then out of the blue someone shows up and they know what you don't know so i've been able to learn from them and to learn how they organize their activism and why they're actually are doing activism because to me that is a form of inspiration to know that i'm not alone and there are quite a number of activists in the african continent who are doing the same thing and yeah, demanding for for change. Well, I'm. I feel like I could talk to you forever, but really, thank you, um, thank you so much. I know it's late there. Thank you so much for for taking the time. I've learned so much from you. You are. I hope you go forward with strength. You are so important. Your voice and um, you. You are just such a such a powerful and impressive and generous uh, young woman. And so I am really very grateful for the time you've given us and, and all that I've learned from you. Thank you so much, Angelina. I love talking to you as well. <laughs>